The game begins with absolutely no introductory cinematic or any scenes of exposition whatsoever. After selecting new game, the player is able to choose between four jobs and create a party, naming each character with up to four letters, and then the game just throws you directly into the overworld, just south of the very first town of the entire Final Fantasy series. The only expository world building the player might have had before this point is when the game first boots up prior to the title screen, which briefly explains FF1's backstory and premise. Essentially, the Earth's climate has been thrown into chaos for unknown reasons, and the world's only hope is an old prophecy that describes four light warriors, each of whom will appear carrying a mysterious orb. By the time the player starts exploring, however, this is as much as we know. Anything else the game tells us is going to be through our interactions with the NPCs. The town and castle just in front of us belong to King Corneria, or Cornelia in some translations. And these are the first accessible areas on the overworld map, though theoretically you could go directly to the game's first dungeon just northwest of here. On the overworld map, Corneria is surrounded by sea on all sides without any other towns nearby. There's a harbor that comes in handy later, but for now we're stranded here, closed in by mountains and ocean. This is a great way to provide the player with a sense of freedom while also constraining our options so that we can experience a relatively linear game and yet still feel that we're making our own decisions and carving our own path. The dungeon to the northwest of here is the only other destination available for now, meaning that we could potentially go straight there, rescue the princess, but assuming that we don't know we're supposed to go there, let's head into town and see what's up. Corneria is composed of two distinct sections, which are the castle and town. There are six buildings in the town of Corneria and eight NPCs, not including the shopkeepers, who are only there to provide the player with a specific service. It's from these NPCs that the player is going to gradually figure out what he or she is supposed to be doing exactly, because the game's abrupt beginning provides no objectives or markers whatsoever which I find kind of liberating in a game. These NPCs aren't strictly personality NPCs though, perhaps with the exception of Arilan, the dancer. I love that you can also tell she's a dancer just by looking at her because of the way her leg is sticking out of her dress as if she's ready to start salsa dancing at any moment. Right now, all she has to say is that her name is Arilan and she's a dancer, but later on she'll become a kind of clue giver if you don't know what to do. You can come back to Kaneria on the ship and talk to her for some advice on where to go. But for now, the other NPCs of Corneria all have something useful to say about this game's world and the player's immediate objectives. By talking to all of them, we can learn the following information. The four orbs need to be revived, that the princess has been kidnapped, and that the king is expecting the light warriors to save his daughter. This effectively sets up the player's long-term and short-term goals, providing us with much-needed direction and giving us a little bit of world-building. It's now evident that the player must find a way to restore their orb's power, which is probably going to happen over the course of the game. So for now, we know that we need to focus on the more immediate objective of rescuing the princess. From here, I explored the town's shops, which on the inside are more like menu screens. It's worth noting that the characters start out with absolutely nothing equipped on them. Even the red mage comes without any magic. Worth noting is that when buying weapons, the game doesn't appear to show you if a certain weapon is superior to the one you already have equipped. Ordinarily, I'd spend more time prepping my characters, but I head up to Cornelia Castle and continue gathering intel. From the soldiers, we learn either that the king is looking for us, or that the princess has been kidnapped. We can also talk with the queen and the princess's sister who implore us to bring Princess Sarah home. The design of the first floor of this castle is a little unusual. There are two separate hallways by the entrance wrapping around the base floor and leading to a back room where there are two mages guarding a locked door. They tell us that these doors are only unlockable with a mystic key meaning that we'll have a reason to come back to Cornelia later on in the game. Heading upstairs, we find a long hallway leading to the king's room. 
In the opposite direction, a soldier gives us very specific information about the whereabouts of the princess. So far, we only know that she's been kidnapped, but now we know that she's being held in a temple to the northwest by a man named Garland. Before going to find her, we can talk with the king, who immediately recognizes us as the Light Warriors. He doesn't tell us where to go, but we've already figured out that part by talking to the soldier down the hall. With nothing else to do for now, the player is free to head northwest to the temple. I only encountered two random battles on the way, and although the dungeon you find there is explorable, even this much is left up to the player's own decision. Because if you want to challenge the boss immediately, he's waiting for you right at the entrance. He identifies himself as Garland before launching us into the game's first boss fight. Despite not properly equipping my team or doing any grinding, I did manage to defeat him. After the battle, maybe because my main fighter was dead, my sprite appears to have been changed to what I think is the monk. Anyway, talk to Princess Sarah to be teleported directly back to the king, who is so happy to see his daughter back that he's suddenly inspired to fix the bridge to the north. This effectively brings the game's first arc to its conclusion, and opens up a path for the player to advance elsewhere. If you talk to some of the NPCs, they'll thank you for rescuing Princess Sarah, but others have new story information about a witch living north of town, providing us with a new short-term objective. From this, we can see how FF1 is going to structure its narrative heading forward. The player moves from one contained space to another, each time being given access to more of the world map than before. In each new place, new short-term objectives become apparent to us on our journey to completing the game's overarching long-term objective of reviving the orbs. Since our heroes are dead or dying, I went back into town to revive them, put my fighter back into the leader position, and rested up at the inn. This being done, if we head outside, we can see the bridge to the north has finished being constructed, and if we step on it, we are treated to the game's opening credits, as if to say, your adventure's only just starting. It's a really clever, almost ingenious piece of game design, allowing the player to feel like they've been dropped into a huge, open world while still carving out a finely tuned, linear narrative. This is essentially the same design model that all Final Fantasy games used until FF10. Even in 7, 8, and 9, which are massive 3D adventures with far more ambitious storylines, the essential game design concept of FF1 remains unchanged. For that reason, FF1 deserves its status as an innovative classic that's had a clear influence on video games since its release in 1987.